Here's internet. Today on Modern Horror, I'd like to revisit the revival of Hammer Horror starting from the very beginning, which was Beyond the Rave in 2008. For anyone who didn't see my very first episode, well, pff, frankly, I don't blame you for that one, but just to catch everyone up, Hammer was an iconic British movie studio that effectively defined horror movies, uh, more specifically monster movies, from the late 50s on into the 70s. But its colorful and melodramatic formula just really couldn't compete against the rise of American art horror and uh, Italian giallo. I almost want to think of it as kind of a, an old-timey Blumhouse, you know, finding a very successful and very inexpensive style and then you know, more or less just sticking with it. Hammer put out some pretty embarrassing movies in the 70s and uh, limped along making anthology horror TV until finally folding in about 1984. But many fans still revered the classic brand. Rights to the name in the catalog traded hands a few times before landing with Dutch producer John DeMole, who announced plans to restart the studio. Now, fans had been promised New Hammer Horror more than a few times before this, but uh, John Boy actually hasn't followed through, and the uh, New Hammer produced series about vampires hit MySpace TV less than a year later. Yeah. In a fairly hokey sounding decision, the New Hammer studio chose to relaunch itself onto the world with a series of four minute long webisodes on a dying social media website. And uh, even more oddly, they never put the final episode online. They held it back until the limited DVD release in 2010. Now, unlike most of the movies I review on this show that have a pretty wide distribution, this was a limited pressing of 5,000 DVDs, and I have number 366. Got this for about five bucks at a local comic book store, so uh, yeah, pays to support local independent business. But this marks the beginning of the Hammer Horror Revival, and I've wanted to give it some time since I started the show. So since all the episodes are available streaming online for free, I think it's fair game. At some point, I'll probably look back at Hammer's theatrical return, which was 2010's Let Me In. But I just did a remake. So for now, let's go Beyond the Rave. The first episode begins with a group of soldiers wearing ridiculous bushes on their heads, going about uh, some sort of maneuver in the woods. And given how seriously they seem to be taking this, I'm assuming that it's training. Otherwise, they are making entirely the wrong kind of assault on the enemy. There are a few quick flashes of a shadow moving across the shot, and one of the soldiers goes to investigate it. It turns out to be a Dracula 2000 cosplayer necking someone in the woods. But when half a clip of rifle fire fails to put down the vampire, he lunges at the soldier possibly mistaking him for uh, Carmen Miranda and going in for an autograph. But then the soldier suddenly wakes up on a gurney in a hospital being called a war hero. In psychiatric terms, he's suicidal. No oh, shit. He charged an enemy stronghold single-handed detective. That's how they found him, sitting, flag in hand, surrounded by corpses. I'm gonna go with dream sequence here rather than flashback, but apparently we're not meant to be too concerned about that since before we can really get our bearings, we cut back to a month ago when our hero, Ed, is going off base for 16 hours of leave before his unit ships to Baghdad. His army buddy here tries to convince him to go out on the town and get whatever's British for crunk, but Ed would rather hang out with his girlfriend and his buddy Necro rolls up in a hearse to see him off. As they drive away from the base, the first episode of Beyond the Rave comes to a close. Now, I got very weary of these episode breaks when I watched the DVD, so I'm gonna ignore them from here on. I mean, they get real old real fast. And if I need to go in four minute chunks, this summary is gonna be very oddly paced. So I think I'll stick to the main narrative flow instead. Anyway, we pick up on an old US Army surplus truck being driven by a guy who looks like the vampire that Ed shot in the opening, as he tools around the countryside with a random woman tied up in the back. Uh, probably for a snack. I mean, you know how badly overpriced rest stop food is, and who really wants McDonald's anyway? I'm also going to assume that he's got UV blocking glass like in Daybreakers, rather than vampires that don't actually burn up in sunlight. This new storyline passes briefly near our original, but doesn't meet, though perspective does shift back to Ed and Necro. To summarize this conversation a bit, last weekend Ed blew off his girlfriend Jen to go hang with his army buddies. So she got angry and went to a raid with Necro that was apparently emceed by the guy driving the truck. He took a liking to her because apparently she looks good in sepia, and they hooked up while Necro was distracted by this goth chick that carved FBP into his happy oh, trail. Babe. So now Jen's not returning Ed's calls. Fucking big penis. Yeah, gosh, I'm really starting to hope this movie actually has vampires in it, and the twist ending won't be that he's just a, an unstable army recruit who went commando on his ex's new boyfriend. 
Real bullets. Real casual. Fuck. But we've still got a few introductions to go, so let's take a moment and cut over to the most British characters in this entire cast. Uh, Necro's drug dealers, Terry and Rich Crocker. Kiss a bell late, all right? These guys' slang is amazing. I actually had to look a lot of this up. We can get a little bit more on tape, yeah? Right. Well, Which brings us to British slang lesson number one. We can get a little bit more on tape, yeah? On tick is short for on ticket, which refers to written credit slips. And Ed and Necro have been driving randomly around the countryside for about three or four hours at this point, seemingly just hoping someone will tell them where the rave is going to be. Now the answer might come to us in the form of this DJ broadcasting an independent EDM radio from a shipping container. Come to claim our prize. We're the ones throwing the party tonight. Seconds. It really is so kind of the vampires to get this guy high as a freaking kite before they drink his blood. I wonder if it's some sort of secondhand high thing. Uh, anyway, they fiddle with the station's radio and then go to join the crew, getting a warehouse ready to host the raid. Jen meets up with Melek, who apparently forgot to get all the right permissions and uh, just bribes the landlord. I'm going to go with Melek being the Turkish word for flowing mane. Or maybe cheap bastard, because the poor guy barely makes it 25 feet before he gets mauled and presumably someone takes that coin back. Ed and Necro's quest for the location of the party leads oh, them to fun. a strip club where both Necro's drug dealers and the two vampires who drank the DJ just happen to be hanging out. <sighs> you know, I need a prop for this. Uh, give me a second to dredge up some sort of, uh, I don't know, plus two staff of unholy plot convenience. <sighs> no. No, not that. Huh. Oh, hey, that's where that went. Aha. All right, let's try this one. Lasicus Screen Riggers! Now, the drug dealers ruin everything here by getting into a fight with vampires. Dolly mixtures have turned up. They're beating the snot out of them before Ed and Necro can ask them about the party. where they go? Oh, it's so hard to stay mad at them, though. They're just so cute in their matching drug dealer white tracksuits. Our heroes pick up Tina and Big Jim from the club and drive back into the night. Now, while moping, Ed realizes that he kind of sort of forgot to tell his father about the whole enlisting in the army and going to training and the deployment that he's about to go on. Oh, I need to go and see him. You got any business? And now for British slang lesson number three. I'm pretty sure what Ed asks for here are Rizlets. These are a popular French brand of rolling papers made out of rice. Put simply, Ed wants to blaze a jade to the face before telling his dad he's going to Iraq. I guess Ed's chat with his dad worked out because he comes back to the hearse with a... flag. Okay. This is from a deleted scene, but the monologue here is so over the top, I, I have to. Here's a snippet of Ed's talk with his father. Tooth and nail he fought to protect him. Held it tight, like a newborn baby. Staring death in the face right there. That close. In the eyes! On a more analytical note, despite being cut, this sequence relates to Ed's being called a war hero in the opening. I think they wanted to have a character arc here about Ed wanting to desert, but then finding some sort of inner hero after having to fight his way out of the vampire's rave. But without this, he's just sort of oddly attached to that flag. My tastes are very singular. In the B-plot, the dealers decide they want some beer, but the vampires have tracked down Terry. They, uh, they beat him up in this alley and carve into his stomach the big, gnarly coke now. Hey, I guess they think he's got enough BP too. Even the vampires are into those tracksuits. Uh, after that brief bit of character motivation, we pop back to Ed and Necro, who have settled into a flat somewhere to do drugs with Big Jim and Tina. In another flash of blinding convenience, Ed sees Necro's FBP reflected in the mirror. No. No, the red marks, not his wang. He realizes it's the number is 987, and further makes the leap that Necro's belly button was intended to be a decimal point, making it 98.7. Tuning their radio to that frequency, they unlock the location of the raid. Hell of a deductive reason. Batman, Ralph Sarchi, Ed Hargest. 
Drug dealer Terry is looking right at it, but he just can't seem to put two and two together. Uh, but he's interrupted by some punk kid who claims to know the location of the guys who beat him up. So he bribes the kid for it. And as luck would have it, they happen to be at the rave. So they go get dressed up in their deal uniforms and head out for the rave along with the rest of this montage. So everything finally lines up and converges on the rave. Ed and Necro are here for Jen, the vampires are here throwing a party, and the drug dealers are here to sell a bunch of drugs uh, to make up some for some sort of budget shortfall, and then beat the crap out of the vampires for beating up Terry for beating up the vampires. Wait, wait, hold on, what? I thought she was mad at him and hooking up with the other guy out of revenge. Well, I guess they're gonna go hash it out and... Jen tries to deliver more of Ed's character arc, but it feels a little bit throwaway because this is kind of the first we've heard of it. You want to stay with me? My aunt has a place on the other sky. We can just go. Anyway, it doesn't go well, and Jen leaves Ed stranded outside. I, uh, I kind of like this middle bit here, even though the plot doesn't advance much, and it's mostly just characters kind of hooking up and Ed bumbling around trying to find more drugs to do when it seems like Jen's more officially broken up with him. I can't say I know what this hallucination here is about, but it is pretty cool. Uh, two easy options are Fear of the War he's about to go to, or a minor flashback if we take this whole story to be Ed recalling the events to the officer that we saw at the military hospital. And this old guy here in the woods is totally awesome. There are a few other side stories going on, but I really don't care about them unless they involve this guy. I smell death on you, soldier. Why don't you go and get some weed then, eh? Silence! I've been smoking this shit for 768 years. How come you're so old then, mate? I'm a vampire. <laughs> and so I offer my victims a choice. Death comes on like a dreamless sleep. You really gotta work on your sales pitch there, bro. Ed finally brings the whole segment to a close when he cold cocks Melek and goes to finish his talk with Jen. Oh, Cliff seven. notes on this conversation is that when Ed blew off Jen, she'd heard he'd gone with his military buddies and banged a hooker. So she retaliated by hooking up with Melek at the raid. Now it turns out he'd just been freaking out that he'd heard he was shipping out to Iraq, so he just went to the bedroom to save face with his squad mates and then just talked about Jen to the hooker. He pulls out a ring and confesses his love to her. Yes. <laughs> With the film at peak romance, we have a sexy montage to a slower song consisting of scenes of Ed and Jen boink in the woods, uh, this random tool getting his knob nibbled off by some women who seem like they've been filling in his Brides of Dracula, uh, Necro discovering his squeeze Lilith is a centuries-old vampire, and a cameo from Sadie Frost, who played Lucy in Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula doing a sexy dance on the high trapeze. Now, this is actually a pretty cool image, although it does remind me a lot of the Blood Rave scene in the first Blade movie, except that was just gratuitous, and this has some amount of strength to it. Now, as both the threesome and the high wire act culminate in blood, one can only assume that Ed also earns his red wings. The lovebirds return to the rave to announce their engagement to a remarkably clean crowd. And uh, this upsets Melek, so he gives the word to herd everyone to the dance floor and seal up all the windows and doors so he can Dutch oven this pitch. <laughs> My god, just... Oh, just look at this pouty fucker. Gas masks are always a pretty cool image, though. Meanwhile, the dealers have apparently made enough money to move on to the oddly specific beating the shit out of those guys that beat me up because we beat them up at the strip club portion of the evening. Let's see how that fucking queer cunt likes his stuffed up his Harris. And this is just in time for another British slang lesson. This time we're getting into some cockney rhyming slang, which gets a bit tricky, but stick with it. Now, rhyming slang generally involves a few cycles of using a phrase that rhymes with the one you want and then shortening. In this case, Harris is short for Rolf Harris, which rhymes with Eris, which is short for Aristotle, which rhymes with Bottle, which is short for Bottle and Glass, 
which rhymes with... Yep. Now, uh, as cool as this looks, I'm really kind of curious why vampires would need to wear gas masks to avoid getting knocked out. I mean, in, in most mythologies, vampires don't actually breathe, you know, being dead and all. And even when they do breathe, they're usually only affected by drugs if they're in the victim's blood, or they're normally affected but have superhuman tolerances. Uh, but, you know, 2008 was also the year that turned Robert Pattinson into a preening, sparkly fairy prince. So I guess getting floored by laughing gas isn't the worst addition you could make to vampire mythology. Anyway, while everyone is passing out from the fumes, Necro's vampire girl is inviting him to come away with them to an island. And I absolutely love the first thing Necro asks is if he can bring Ed. Can, can Ed come? A bromance for the ages. Uh, now there have been snippets of this dropped in several episodes, but they didn't really come together until now. Basically, to escape persecution, the vampires are going to relocate to an island, but they need blood for the trip, so they're hosting the rave as an elaborate ruse to get a bunch of people out in the middle of the woods where they can knock them out and uh, harvest them. Back inside the warehouse, the vampires start draining people, and they really screwed the pooch on the dosage for the knockout gas, since the main characters are all awake. But I will give them some medical points back for using the femoral artery to drain the blood since it is larger than the karate. Back outside, the dealers are beginning their assault on the warehouse and turn off the gas, which apparently clears instantly. This guy, Ninja Rave Vampire, gets the jump on the Crockers, but Big Jim wakes up and beats the shit out of him. Now people start waking up and running for it, but Malik is outside to pick him off with a crossbow, which just isn't very sporting at all. Ed runs out and then decides to arm himself with this conveniently placed scimitar and goes to rescue Jen. He's intercepted, but he easily takes out this rubber-faced bastard. Oh, good night, sweet prince. Rich and Terry try to hole up in the warehouse bathroom to protect their brother who was being drained. To say this ends poorly is an understatement. Their brother gets bitten by one of the brides who is hiding while Rich and Terry are taunting the other two vampires. Terry suddenly notices someone gnawing on his brother and takes her out, but then the other bride grabs him while Rich gets hardcore stabbed and then shot through the neck for good measure. Cool. Big Jim manages to escape and finally a vampire is actually killed with a stake. Only then Big Jim sort of arbitrarily sacrifices himself so Ed and Jen can lock themselves in the DJ shipping container slash studio. After Melek takes Jim out, he sends Necro in to negotiate. There's a boat leaving tomorrow for an island off the coast of Africa. Oh, son, if it's Madagascar, they probably already closed their borders when Terry coughed earlier in the movie. Come with us. I've made my decision, Nick. Jen. With their decisions made, Ed and Necro part ways. It's a hug. Don't fucking bite me. before he and Jen sneak out the back where they're assaulted by a vampire DJ who's no match for an Irish woman with a shovel. Oh look, what a conveniently placed ATV. Uh, they almost make it out of the woods when Malik apparently hears the ATV and shoots an arrow to the air. Where it lands, he knows not where. Sometimes convenience works for the bad guys and it kills Jen, which upsets Ed a little bit, and he decides to joust Melek using the flag.
Now, though he does hit Ed with the crossbow, the flag also connects, but Malk is apparently the only vampire in this movie who it takes more than a minor flesh wound to kill, and uh, being impaled doesn't really phase him that much. And Ed was saved by... something. Now, Malik is in the middle of his silly human speech when suddenly the sun rises and he freaking explodes. Now, Ed wanders off where an army jeep just happens to be driven by his friends and takes him to the airport. So, Ed and Jen would have been totally fine if they'd waited like 15 minutes in the storage container. All they had to do was just not open the door and wait for sunrise. All Melik had was a crossbow. I, I think they would have been fine. Uh, the cop we saw in the beginning starts reporting the massacre, and then that night, Necro Lilith and Uncle Toxalot drive away. Oh, thank fucking Providence. I thought my arm was gonna fall off waving this bastard staff of convenience. Honestly, I mean, Beyond the Rave isn't actually all that bad. Uh, getting the negatives out of the way, it took them way too long for things to get moving. They ended up at the rave in the first third of the movie, which isn't actually too bad. But it felt like it took way longer because of that four minute long episode format. They'd spend 75% of each episode with the main characters regardless of what they were doing and then give like 30 seconds to each side story, and that felt really disjointed. Once all the characters were actually at the rave and part of the same event, the format felt a lot less awkward and moved much more naturally from beat to beat. I never really got the sense that the vampires were very powerful at all. I mean, only a few of them actually took more than like one hit to go down, and even in legitimate fights, it seemed like regular people could hold their own pretty well. Uh, the vampires seemed pretty danged average in strength, speed, and agility. The only real advantage they had was not aging. I don't even know about them having any unnatural charms that they used to seduce Jen, since uh, she seemed pretty hot for anyone who wasn't Ed at the time and didn't really seem super into the whole boat ride thing. The most menacing moment was when they had just gassed everyone and started hoisting people up to drain them, and that didn't last very long before a few drug dealers totally screwed up their plans while making fart jokes. Smell that. Your fucking guts again. All of that stuff aside, once they actually got to the rave, the story moved along well enough and had some pretty cool imagery provided at a decent rate. They had a lot of lighter beats to each episode without it feeling like they'd inserted a bunch of cringy comic relief, and I really appreciated a lot of the vampire shoutouts. They included, like, uh, Sadie Frost's cameo, Ingrid Pitt had a cameo that was in the deleted scene, and I'm taking the minor violin part as a Lestat nod and probably some others that I'm missing. Yeah, I made a lot of fun of the convenient writing, but it could have been a lot worse, and I think a lot of it came down to the time they had and their format, forcing them to take shortcuts to move the story along. If you remove the Hammer reputation, it's a pretty entertaining, low-budget action horror that one could argue had vampires in. Anyway, that's all for Modern Horror. Thanks so much for watching. Next up is Paranormal Activity 4 in all its weirdness, and in the meantime, stay tuned to this channel for some instant screaming. Like and subscribe for more videos, and if you're feeling particularly awesome and want to support the show, you can check out our Patreon campaign here. Cheers, folks!